Today is Tuesday, July the 18th, 2006. Uh, we are in Gilderland at the home of uh, Joseph Persico, who is uh, an award-winning uh, author, and uh, he is the author of The Imperial Rockefeller, and he worked with uh, Governor Rockefeller as a, a speechwriter for many years. Uh, Mr. Persico, first off, I wonder if you would begin by um, telling us a little bit about how you came to work for Nelson Rockefeller. In 1966, I was the speechwriter for the Commissioner of Health of New York State. The Rockefeller administration that year was promoting a billion dollar bond issue to clear up water pollution in New York State. I got a call from the governor's communications director, Hugh Morrill, asking if I could provide some information so that they could prepare a speech uh, promoting the Pure Waters bond issue. I thought I heard opportunity knocking, and instead of giving s simply information, I wrote a speech, and I put a great deal of effort into it, and I probably neglected my boss, the health commissioner, Hollis Ingraham, while I was doing this. I sent the speech down to the governor's office. Uh, it was delivered, and shortly thereafter, I was asked to come aboard on the governor's team as his speechwriter. Uh, what, are, what are some of the, uh, the projects that you worked on when you first came on board? Well, as I say, the, the water pollution was a major issue. Then subsequently, there were his election campaigns. Uh, <clears throat> that year, 1966, he was running uh, for his third term as governor, and I was deeply involved in my first campaign. Uh, there were other uh, bond issues, the transportation bond issue, which it was another mega million dollar whopper program. He um, also was promoting initiatives in the state that were far ahead of the federal government. For example, we were promoting uh, government support of the arts. Uh, we were promoting, at the time that the inner cities were rotting in this country, we were prom promoting the Urban Development Corporation. So in, in this era, Nelson Rockefeller was pretty much out front of the country. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you would talk a little bit about that. Uh, what kind of vision did uh, Rockefeller bring to, uh, to governing in a state like New York? Well, Nelson Rockefeller uh, always had his eye on the prize, which was the presidency, which meant that he had to, to be seen as, a, as a, a shaker and a mover. So consequently, we were always involved in what I, I thought of as a new crusade. Uh, one year it was the um, program to end the old system of automobile in, uh, insurance and, and have a, a no-fall automobile insurance uh, plan. Another uh, occasion he was even ahead of what the country is doing now and that was he wanted universal health insurance. So I would say that the, the hallmark of the Rockefeller leadership style was new ideas and the uh, very energetic uh, pursuit of these ideas. Okay. And how, how did that play out in terms of the dynamics with the state workforce? Was it kind of a, I would have imagined that it was uh, something that would be uh, very warmly received because it would mean more jobs. Well, I think that Governor Rockefeller was quite popular among the uh, public service employees, the state employees, particularly because he uh, was not averse to union organization, uh, no negotiations, collective bargaining, all of these uh, ideas that we associate with the labor movement in the United States. He had come to the governorship with a background in having dealt with unions in uh, building Rockefeller Center. He was closely involved, and he was, and he was a reasonable guy. And um, so consequently, he, he brought those attitudes into state government. He also did something really extraordinary for a Republican. He would line up in, in the four gubernatorial campaigns that he was involved in dozens of, la of, of, of labor organizations, and this is something usually in the bag for Democratic candidates, but he managed to uh, work with these people, and he was uh, f fairly generous in his uh, approach to their aims, so that he enjoyed marvelous support from the, the state workforce. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, talk a little bit more about uh, his role in, in building uh, uh, Rockefeller Center, because you mentioned that uh, he worked closely with the unions to make that project uh, uh, happen and that it then shaped uh, much of uh, what came afterwards. Well, he, he was running Rockefeller Center as a rather young man. First, he was involved in the, the construction of it, and his, his father, uh, John D. Rockefeller Jr., essentially handed the baton uh, to Nelson Rockefeller when he was in his mid-twenties to run this, this ma massive enterprise. So it was, it was terrific um, training for him in business administration and just leadership skills generally. And these he brought into his appointments in the federal government. You know, he served under uh, President Eisenhower. Uh, and um, he served under President Roosevelt even before that. So he, he honed his skills, I think, to some, to some extent, uh, leading the construction and operation in the, really in the depression of, of Rockefeller Center. Now, uh, the Rockefeller name was not always uh, uh, so well uh, revered by uh, working people and, and unions. Uh, how did that uh, affect uh, uh, how he approached uh, his relationship with working people? Well, I think that the, uh, the governor, uh, he was the first Rockefeller Republican, and we, we, by which we mean a, a moderate Republican. And he was receptive to the needs of the, of the public at large. That is, as I mentioned already, Nobody in the country was pushing for universal uh, health care when he was doing it way back in the 60s and the 70s. And he was out front on, uh, on discrimination, whether against uh, blacks or whether against women. So these were uh, approaches and uh, initiatives that would have appealed to a broad public and not a narrow business-oriented republic, which is a bind that many Republican uh, candidates and leaders would get themselves into. Um, how did how did he personally cultivate those relationships? Well, the, the governor was uh, terrific at at winning allies. I'm almost uh, tempted to say s seducing people, people particularly of the opposition. Uh, for, for example, when he was in office, the state senate was Republican controlled, but the assembly, as it still is, was Democrat controlled. So he would bring in the Democratic leaders from the legislature, and very frankly, uh, in, in an honest way, but he would cut deals. He would bring them on board. He knew that they had uh, uh, needs and they had objectives that would please their, their constituency, and so he would play to these. He uh, also did the same thing, as I mentioned, with, with labor leaders who might not have been naturally inclined to support him. But he had a way of embracing people, not only those who were in his party, but people who were outside of it, either through blandishments, inducements, cajoling, but he got things done. Did, did you ever witness any of uh, these uh, sessions? One of the most unforgettable uh, situations that I remember was there was a Democrat leader. His name was Meet Esposito, and I think he may have been the leader from Brooklyn, but I'm not sure, but he was a, a power in, in state democratic politics. And the governor had him over to his mansion on Fifth Avenue to discuss matters. But at one point, Esposito looked at one of Rockefeller's uh, paintings. And as we all know, he was a, he was a great uh, art collector. And uh, Mead Esposito had admired one of these paintings. And the governor said, well, take it, Mead. Well, that's kind of irresistible. <laughs> pretty, pretty amazing. Now, now, for you as, uh, uh, as a young speechwriter, uh, I would imagine when you're dealing with a, an individual who really is larger than life, like uh, Nelson Rockefeller, that must be somewhat intimidating. Uh, how did you adjust to, uh, to working with him? Well, it, you know, working with a, a powerful family member like a Nelson Rockefeller uh, could have been a little bit intimidating, and probably in my early days it was. But there are things that humanize other people and uh, make us more tolerant of, of them and seeing them in a human light. For example, in my case, uh, I'm, I'm here talking to you and I'm not having much trouble speaking. And I, If I had to read from this book in front of me, it would not be a problem. But Nelson Rockefeller suffered from dyslexia, uh, which made an interesting challenge for a speechwriter. That is, dyslexia, he would transpose 
uh, words. And if he meant con conservation, he would say conversation. If he meant 1986, he might say 1968. Uh, so this was a, quite a challenge for a speech writer. But it also it showed me that that ev everybody has has their burdens to bear. And though he was rich and he was powerful, he had his limitations that aroused my sympathy. Mm -hmm. Now, how, how did you cultivate your working relationship with him? Well, it was not uh, it was not easy because the governor would uh, prefer to just to get up and and speak. Uh, uh, because he had difficulty reading. He, he was a stumbling reader. So I would uh, work with him trying to produce the, the simplest possible language, not too complicated. And uh, speechwriters often want to go off on great flights of fancy and they want to write the inaugural of, such as Franklin Roosevelt stunned the country with in 1933 or uh, John F. Kennedy in 1961. Uh, Nelson Rockefeller like meat and potatoes, prose style. So that that's what I uh, was was trying to serve up for the most part. He would uh, sometimes depart in ways from the text that could be quite interesting. On one occasion, he was going to be speaking before the League of Women Voters, promoting no fault insurance. There was a mess before when there was an, an automobile accident. This side would have to prove that they were not guilty, and the other side would say, no, we were innocent, you were guilty. It was a terrible situation. So he was promoting no-fault insurance, and he was speaking, as I say before, the League of Women Voters. And um, he had a part of the speech which, which went along something like this that I had furnished him. Imagine that you were in an accident. Imagine that you were injured. Imagine that you were then out of work. Imagine that you couldn't pay your bills. And uh, so I gave him the text and then went to hear him deliver the speech before the League of Women Voters. And somehow, in the course of delivering the speech, he decided he didn't want to put the burden on his audience. So he turned it around and said, supposing I was in an accident, supposing I was injured, suppose I couldn't go to work, suppose I couldn't pay my bills. Well, the laughter was clocked at about seven minutes nonstop. That's very good. <laughs> um, can you um, tell me a little bit about um, how um, how the dynamics worked in the among the senior staff uh, in uh, in his office? Uh, what, what were the relationships between some of the? Tell us about who some of the key players were yeah. and uh, the relationships yeah. there. Well, I don't, I don't want to make this sound like Pollyanna because when you're working at that level with with a, a man as powerful as not Nelson Rockefeller, the people he attracts have strong egos. And so they would clash occasionally. But on the whole, I would say that it was a pretty uh, happy ship. I think there was mutual respect among most of the people. Uh, the uh, person I worked with most closely under the governor was Al Marshall, secretary of the governor, just a massively, massively able man who himself could have stepped into the governor's shoes. Extraordinary guy. He had a capacity to make people want to do what he said, which is a great leadership quality. He had been a Marine leader during World War II, and, and I was always happy I had not served under him because if he said, take that hill, I probably would have gone and tried to take that hill with disastrous consequences. Uh, an, another major figure at the time was his counsel, uh, Robert R. Douglas, Bobby Douglas, who was indefatigable. I, uh, the, he was a combination of great personal charm, very attractive guy, who could have gotten by on the charm alone, but would work himself to exhaustion as a member of the staff. And I admired him enormously, particularly because though he was in the, in the, in the legal side of the governor's staff, he had a real appreciation for language. And I, as in a sense, the, the staff writer, had a wonderful relationship with him in that he took pleasure in going over speeches with me, which other people seem to regard as a chore. The, uh, the governor's chief uh, financial advisor was T. Norman Hurd, something of a legend in state government. He had uh, served the same purpose under Governor Dewey. A, a seemingly prim, precise man, but a, a, a wonderful human being. <laughs> I have an unforgettable recollection of having sent a speech to uh, Norm Hurd once and uh, waiting for his reaction. It came back, 
and he said that he thought it was beautifully punctuated, which was not <laughs> quite what I was looking for. Uh, there were, on, on the whole, I was amazed at Rockefeller's capacity to draw top people into state government. Uh, he, would, he would do it sometimes with uh, inducements outside of their state payrolls. He might supplement them. When he was uh, being uh, considered for vice president, when he was uh, picked by President Jerry Ford, uh, the governor got into some trouble, and some 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 of these payments were considered irregular, inappropriate. Uh, for example, one of his first and foremost uh, allies was William J. Ronan, a leading public administrator in this country, and the governor had loaned fair amounts of of money uh, to to Ronan. It became an issue, but not a not a fatal objective because in the end Rockefeller was. Uh, approved. But one of his techniques was providing inducements extra uh, to, to one's state salary, which were always rather modest. And he had this way to bring in the person he wanted, and he got them. Interesting. Now, w one of the things that, uh, as I've talked to other people about uh, the Rockefeller era, uh, is that he always wanted everything to be done first rate, uh, so that for example, when uh, the state was considering a collective bargaining law, which eventually became uh, known as the Taylor Law, he went out and tried to find the very best people in this field uh, who could uh, come together with the ideas to uh, develop uh, a law for New York. I wonder if you would talk about uh, that dynamic. Well, one of the uh, observations that I made about uh, Governor Rockefeller, in which I, I tried to illustrate when I wrote my book, The Imperial Rockefeller, is that he had the uh, power to summon. Some public figures lacking his stature, lacking his background, lacking his family prestige, would not be able to get everybody to answer their call. But when Nelson Rockefeller called somebody or summoned somebody, they came. He had what I call the power to summons. And uh, this led to him being able to achieve his objective, which was to surround himself with the ablest people. Uh, he carried this attitude into just about everything he did. Uh, I, I remember him just one time revealing one of his uh, management impulses, which is if you're trying to achieve 100% of something, the first 95% is not difficult. The last 5% marks the difference between a slipshod, half-baked job and something approaching perfection. And he did that in, in, in every approach uh, to his state government initiatives, including going the extra length to recruit the ablest people. How did, how did, that, um, how did that play out with regard to the state workforce? What was his uh, thinking in terms of wanting to have the best people working for the state of New York beyond just the, the, the higher levels? Well, the, the governor uh, realized that if he was going to be an able leader, as he would be in any, any field, business, government, the clergy, whatever, that your success is going to depend on the quality of people that you attract. And he was not about to try to skimp on the state budget uh, by holding the um, state workforce down at, at, at low levels of compensation. So he was very good, very good at putting through raises uh, for people. Also, he was very clever in that he knew that at, at times you get a bad news bounce out of a raise for public service employees, so he would do it kind of uh, through the back door. He would ease the, the, the pension contributions or in, in, in other ways provide a, a greater take-home pay for the state worker that would not immediately translate as to another raise. Um, do you remember much about the inception of the Taylor Law and uh, how that came about? Well, the Taylor Law was not uh, really my bailiwick except to write speeches explaining the merits of it and the, the undesirable conditions it would, it, would, uh, it would correct. But I do remember this, that uh, the people negotiating with the governor from, let's say, the labor side were coming on pretty tough, pretty strong. And he was no uh, 
marshmallow as a ne negotiator himself. But I think what they sensed was this is not an anti-union government leader. And so, as a result, reasonable compromises were made, and the law was strong, and it endures to this day. Sure, absolutely. Um, do, you re do you recall interactions between Governor Rockefeller and uh, people in the state workforce at uh, different junctures? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's good. Um, you know, you mentioned earlier that there was always this driving ambition uh, to achieve uh, the presidency. Um, how did that affect the way he governed New York? Well, the way he handled that, that ambition to become uh, president, in, in a way, was admirable but unfortunate. Nelson Rockefeller looked upon the quest for the presidency a little bit as the merit system. If I do a better job as governor than other governors. My merit will be recognized. It will push me to the forefront of, uh, of those under consideration for my party's nomination for the presidency. Consequently, taking that merit system approach, he, to some extent, neglected the political road. I mean, while he was out pushing no-fault insurance or universal uh, health care, you had people like Richard Nixon who were attending all of the Republican rubber chicken circuit dinners, you know, cultivating their base in, in today's terms. And he didn't do a particularly impressive job of cultivating his base, so that when he would go to a, a Republican convention, he did not have the friends sewn up that uh, candidates who were working that other level uh, had succeeded in having. Um, I wonder if you would uh, maybe talk, I see right behind you you have uh, uh, Franklin Roosevelt, uh, a photo of Franklin Roosevelt up on the wall. Uh, obviously, throughout the 20th century, the governors of New York have aspired <coughs> to the presidency, and with uh, uh, Roosevelt and Al Smith and uh, uh, Tom Dewey and uh, Nelson Rockefeller, it's a, it's a very formidable uh, group of people. I wonder if you might talk a little bit about uh, uh, the dynamic that drives the governor of New York to want to be the president and uh, uh, maybe some of the differences between those individuals. Well, New York is, is the empire state. New York was, all of my growing up, the most populous state. So consequently, governors of New York were automatic contenders for the presidency, obviously not so true anymore since we've lost population and lost clout in Congress. But uh, Nelson Rockefeller certainly hoped that uh, his native state would be a stepping stone to the presidency. But I've talked a little bit about the liberality of his policies and his ability to court, court middle-of-the-road voters and even dip well into the Democratic voters for his four victories. And I will never forget something very interesting. He was making a goodwill trip to Latin America on behalf of uh, President Nixon. This was in 1969. He was going to all the Latin American countries. And we were in Argentina, and the governor held a press conference. And one of the uh, Argentine journalists at the conference said, Senor uh, Rockefeller, you're such a powerful man. You're such an able man. Why did you never become president of your country? And he said something I don't think he would have ever said anywhere near the continental United States. He said, I was in the wrong party. Very, very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, can, can you tell us a little bit about uh, his style compared to some of those other uh, aspirants? Well, I think the governor was, 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 was very different from his immediate process, uh, predecessor, who was Averill Harriman who was an able man, an admirable man, but who had no political fingertip feel. He didn't really know how to deal with people in an engaging way as Rockefeller did. He, uh, he was uh, different from Governor Dewey, and the Governor Dewey was a very uh, tough, stern, able governor. Again, not particularly lovable. I think that a lot of... Uh, what Nelson Rockefeller uh, understood, he had learned from his service under President Franklin Roosevelt. He had s served as coordinator of inter-American affairs during World War II. That is, his job was to keep 
the uh, Latin American countries in our column supporting the United States in its war effort. And what he learned from, from Roosevelt was that you don't go by the book. You improvise. Uh, if, if you have a State Department that is not doing uh, the job the way you want them to do it, create a parallel organization. In this instance, the coordinator of Inter-American Affairs. Uh, Rockefeller learned from, from Roosevelt not to be afraid to shake up the organization chart. Uh, he would do that when he was governor. For example, uh, you, you had a number of state agencies that would be involved, let's say, in housing. Uh, he was not happy when there were the riots in the 60s in the inner cities with the pace of change by existing agencies. He creates a whole new parallel agency, the Urban Development Corporation. So I think that his uh, tutelage under Franklin Roosevelt uh, was formative in his leadership. <coughs> now in the, um, in the 1960s when uh, he was primarily uh, uh, governing uh, New York State, that was a time of great upheaval uh, in this in this country. Um, what kind of a, 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 I mean, and obviously he was trying to change a lot about the way New York operated and had, as you mentioned, uh, this vision for where he wanted uh, to, to take our uh, government. Um, how do you think that um, the events of the 60s affected him and uh, how did he respond to it? Well, the, there were some shocking occurrences in the 60s, the assassinations of President Kennedy, subsequently his brother, Martin Luther King, etc. And there were times when the country seemed on the, the edge of chaos. And one thing that this brought out in, in Governor Rockefeller was an irrepressible optimism. No matter how bad the news was, he refused to uh, interpret it as some kind of a malaise that went deep into the American character. We heard a lot of that during that period. And he just th th thought that, no, this is not the way to go. We, we've, we've got to have a positive outlook. So he was, he was not uh, emotionally defeated by this, this disasters that the country was undergoing. I've already s spoken about his response to the uh, riots in the inner cities, creating an urban development corporation. Uh, during the uh, Vietnam uh, controversy, which was running red hot in the 60s, the war was looked unwinnable, the casualties were mounting, uh, he, he, uh, he took a position which uh, did succeed in terms of, of, of military administration. He was practically the first one out of the box promoting a, an all-volunteer army, which we now have. You know, it's a great army. Uh, and he was out front on that. So he would respond to the problems that we were going through during the, the, the chaotic turmoil of the 60s. Yeah. Um, certainly uh, he uh, put his imprint on the city of Albany beyond, uh, uh, you know, in, in addition to what, what he did throughout uh, New York State, but certainly he transformed uh, the city of Albany, particularly through the building of uh, the South Mall. I wonder if you would talk about uh, that project and uh, what you remember of, uh, of his role in making that happen. I have a very uh, personal sense of Nelson Rockefeller's transformation of the state capital. I came to Albany as, as a student what was then known as New York State College for Teachers, a little tiny campus. And I remember vividly uh, the south end of Albany, which was acres upon acres of, uh, of tenements, brothels, gin mills, pretty uh, sorry state. So many years later, I find myself working uh, for Governor Rockefeller in the speech writing capacity, and he does transform the city. Um, what had been a little state teacher's college becomes a massive university today, State University of New York at Albany, 15,000 students, ultra-modern campus on the edge of the city, uh, all of the <coughs> decrepit tenements uh, and the shabby housing that I referred to earlier was gone. It created certain uh, social uh, maladjustments that had to be corrected, but that's been replaced now by this rather extraordinary office complex that we call the new the Nelson A. Rockefeller Empire State Plaza. So it, 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 the city looks differently as a result of his having been governor. Mm. 
And and uh, how did how did he, that project come about? How did he uh, actually make that happen? Why did he want to uh, uh, build that uh, complex? The legend is that uh, in the late fifties, Governor Rockefeller was visited by a person of Dutch royalty. It might have been a Princess Beatrix or Queen Juliana. I'm fuzzy on that point. But it was a, a, a Dutch royal was visiting Albany because Albany had a, a, a sister relationship uh, with a city in Holland. So at the end of the visit, the governor was in the limousine with this person, and they were headed back to the Albany airport. And he was embarrassed. There were all these tumble-down, shabby tenements, and winos in the streets. And he thought, I wonder what this woman must think of the capital of the Empire State. And at that point, he resolved that this had to be transformed. And we had to have a, a, a capital that, that, that matched the stature of the state. And that was really the impetus for what we now call the Empire State Plaza. And how did he go about uh, getting this uh, project accomplished? He, he got the financing of the project accomplished by, uh, by, by financial finessing. He was very creative, and he worked with the um, mayor of Albany, Erastus Corning. Uh, my knowledge of the financing is a little weak, but he worked out a, a, a deal to obtain the rather considerable financing to build this huge office complex by a rental arrangement with, this, with the city of Albany, which, which is to own the ground underneath, by floating uh, a new kind of bond, which was called the, the moral oblig obligation bond, which didn't require uh, the state having to prove it was going to have the revenues to support this construction plan. Anyway, there was this kind of financial black magic that he came up with, which was a, a Rockefeller hallmark. It isn't that we can't do something, we just find a way to do it. Um, in, in some ways, do you think that the, um, the uh, South Mall uh, came to symbolize the Rockefeller administration in, in some in positive and some negative ways? This, the, what we originally called the South Mall, now Empire State Plaza, in, in a way is emblematic of the Rockefeller style. First of all, it is totally incongruous with every building around it. It, it resembles Brasilia, not upstate New York. Uh, so that's very much Nelson Rockefeller. This is what I want, and so uh, this is how, how it was carried out with uh, Wally Harris involved and, and a number of other architects who were close friends of his. Uh, you go into the building, and there is his taste in art. There are these huge oil murals, uh, w which to the layman are usually incomprehensible, but they were his style of art, and that's what we see there. Uh, however, the objective, which was to draw the capital back into the capital city, that is the, the, the business of government back into the city, which was becoming scattered all around the Albany area. That was successful, and I think it's been a real shot in the arm to the capital, not, not only in terms of uh, government leadership, but in terms of cultural access development. And it's, it's been a plus on, on, on balance. Mm -hmm. But it certainly was a, a project that took a long time to accomplish, wasn't even completed while he was uh, in office. How did that uh, play out in the public's perception of it? Well, at the time that the uh, plaza was being constructed, it, it looked like it would never be completed and looked like the, the cost would never stop hemorrhaging. Nelson Rockefeller had built Rockefeller Center, so he'd gone through all these kinds of complaints before. I don't think he was at all upset uh, by any of this very deeply. I remember very vividly going into his office with a speech one day, and his office windows fronted the construction site. And the largest tower at that point was half constructed. And the workmen had taken yellow paint and in 10-foot letters, they had written on the core of that building, Rocky's Pyramid. And the governor was looking out at that, and he just nodded his head and he smiled, not at all offended. Very, very interesting. Um, you, you mentioned something a little earlier about uh, going to uh, the Albany Teachers College, and I think that uh, many people looking at the Rockefeller uh, years 
look at his development of the state university system as being uh, uh, one of his crowning achievements. And I wonder if you might talk about uh, uh, what you saw of his attempt to advance that project. Well, the, the governor was very concerned about able students leaving New York State, studying elsewhere. At the time, the system of public education was academically uh, acceptable, but it was a, just a tiny sliver of higher education in the state. It was a, a, a chain of maybe about 10 little teachers' colleges devoted almost exclusively to preparing people for the New York State, junior high schools, grade schools, high schools. The governor felt that we had to have a new magnet to keep students here. And so he launched uh, the State University of New York construction program, which today has something like 65 campuses, major, major centers, uh, Binghamton, SUNY, Albany, et cetera. These are, are, are big, serious institutions of higher education. And it was done, as I say, to keep students from feeling they couldn't be educated outside the state, that they could do it at home. And uh, what, what do you remember of him uh, personally advocating for that and uh, uh, carrying it forward uh, across the state? Well, ag again, he used his uh, financial ledger domain to figure out how you built these huge, very extensive campuses. And again, he, he used a great deal of, of imagination, courting people who, uh, who knew how these things could be done within the state budget limitations. And the, the result is just extraordinary. I th I, my, my belief is that today, the SUNY system, in terms of total enrollment, may be the largest in the country. Mm, very, very interesting. Um, do, you re do you remember him going out to the groundbreakings? Do you remember him uh, out uh, um, uh, trying to make sure that this would actually come to fruition? Well, y yes, he, he very often was present when when the new university was uh, laying a, corner uh, a cornerstone or when it was being dedicated. And in a related sense, we were talking a moment ago about the, uh, the Empire State Plaza. He made sure just before he left office in 1974 that though it was incomplete, a ceremony was held, a dedication ceremony was held in which he is the prominent figure to imprint on the public memory that this is the man who built the Empire State Plaza. Um, what was, uh, what was uh, the governor's relationship like with some of the other uh, important uh, political figures uh, in New York State at that time? I mean, you mentioned uh, earlier the, the assassination of, uh, of Robert Kennedy, and uh, of course he was uh, the senator from New York uh, at, the t at the time. I wonder if you would talk about the dynamics of their relationship. Well, the dynamic... Uh undeniably between uh, Robert F. Kennedy, who in a sense came in the state as a successful carpetbagger, got elected to the Senate, and Nelson Rockefeller was uh, uh, two men looking down the road at the same office. And uh, while there was not any nasty, o overt uh, behavior between the two, there was the, that, that wary maneuvering of potential rivals. That was very, very clear. How about uh, Jacob Javits, who was the senior senator from New York at the time, and also ja a Republican? <clears throat> Jack Javits uh, and Nelson Rockefeller, uh, in the same party, got along rather, rather well because Javits was, let me use this expression, a Rockefeller Republican. He was a very liberal Republican. And uh, so he and Nelson Rockefeller would not cross swords on many substantive issues, but there was another Republican in the state, the, the mayor of New York City, John Lindsay, who just stuck in Nelson Rockefeller's craw. He found Lindsay to be overly idealistic and impractical. Uh, there was a 1968 a horrendous garbage strike in New York, and it was awful. The stuff was piling up uh, maybe 20 feet on the sidewalks of New York, and Rockefeller seeing this, essentially went in and brushed Lindsay aside, took over the union negotiations, and ended the strike. 
and uh, what did that do in terms of uh, uh, the relationship with the mayor? This soured the relationship further, which already uh, was off to a poor start between the mayor and the governor. How, how did uh, something like that affect uh, the perception of Rockefeller with, with the public? Were people uh, pleased that he stepped in and did that, uh, or was it uh, maybe a little bit of a sense that he had overstepped the bounds? I, I think any time when you have a public crisis and you see strong leadership that moves in and solves the problem, the, the net result can't be anything but favorable. And I think people were very impressed by how the governor got the garbage off the streets of New York, got the sanitation men back to work. Uh, naturally, in the, in the Lindsay camp, there was a, a, great, a great deal of, of complaint, criticism at the state government stepping into what was a local issue. But I think results are what people measure. Mm -hmm. um, I, would, I would imagine, and I think that if you, you look at the dynamics of how um, the uh, executive legislative relations have evolved, but with a, a figure of uh, Nelson Rockefeller's uh, stature, that I would imagine that in those days the, uh, the legislature was very much a second fiddle uh, in Albany. I wonder if you would talk a little bit about the relationship between uh, him and the legislative leaders at that time. Well, the governor realized that the, the, the way state government is organized, that no matter uh, how desirable a, a goal he set forth, a program that he wanted, in the end, he's got to have the state assembly approve it, and he's got to have the state senate. So he was very, very, very good at wooing legislative leaders. If they were the, the, the Republican side, he would see that they got their quid pro quo. I, re I remember one instance when the governor wanted to uh, create the Saratoga Performing Arts Center that the western end of the state, which was not going to get much benef benefit from an art center in the eastern end of the state, saw that it, an art park was approved and built in the Buffalo area. So he, he knew how to play the game of give and take, whether, whether he was dealing with legislators who were Republicans or Democrats. And I think the measure of his success is the Rockefeller record, uh, which is really quite extraordinary. Um, can, can you tell us a little bit about, uh, about Malcolm Wilson and uh, the relationship uh, between him and, uh, and Governor Rockefeller? I should have thought of that before. The, uh, the governor was certainly never threatened by his lieutenant governor. Malcolm Wilson was extremely loyal, uh, a, a very fine man. I, I became very close to him personally. Uh, very um, amusing companion within government, but he, didn't, he, he did not scintillate uh, to the broad public. But the governor always listened to his viewpoint. Every meeting I ever attended, he never neglected to ask uh, what the lieutenant governor thought, which was wise because Rockefeller, as we've said, was a very liberal political figure for a Republican. And, Mal and uh, Malcolm Wilson represented a more conservative element. So Rockefeller touched that base. He didn't uh, necessarily uh, veto anything because, Nelson, because uh, Wilson opposed it, <clears throat> but he did take his... Uh, his position into account, and did a, a great favor for uh, Malcolm Wilson. Wilson, who had served the state for 30 years as a legislator and then as lieutenant governor, governor had ambitions to be governor himself. And when Rockefeller decided that he had enough of Albany and wanted to pursue national ambitions in 1973, I believe, possibly 74. He left before the end of his fourth term, which gave Malcolm Wilson a tremendous leg up because as lieutenant governor, the governor leaves, he becomes governor. Uh, it did not save uh, Malcolm in the general election uh, subsequently, but it certainly gave him a head start. Um, what kind of role did he play um, in the uh, the activities of the administration? Did he do the rubber chicken circuit? Uh, did he have any kind of policy role? We're talking about Malcolm, Malcolm Wilson. Wilson yeah. Malcolm Wilson did. He, you, you might say that he that he nur he nurtured and nourished the right. Uh, he had friends all over the state. 
he was out there always mending fences. Uh, my sense of it is that while Nelson Rockefeller would take a particularly uh, liberal stand on, on an issue, health insurance, whatever, Nelson Rockef uh, that Malcolm Wilson would be uh, mending fences for him and making it clear to the more conservative wing of the party, well, in the long run, this is good for the state. He knows what he's doing. We can trust Nelson Rockefeller. What, what would you say uh, um, Rockefeller would look upon as his greatest achievements uh, as governor of New York? I think very clearly the governor would point to the state university system, which, as we've mentioned before, was just a, a, a very small operation with a narrow focus of teacher preparation. And now it's a massive, massive institution or, or agglomeration of institutions of higher education. And he, and he stated that. I remember very vividly on his last day in office as governor, he had resigned uh, and was making his farewell speech. And there was a madcap operation going on in my office and in some of the other offices, the press office, to give to the reporters the Rockefeller record, which ran something like 10 or 12 single space pages of what he had accomplished. And at the very top was creation of the State University of New York. What was probably not in uh, the release would have been what uh, some of his, his regrets uh, might have been. What uh, what might you uh, think he would... Well, probably the, the, the one black mark uh, that will never be entirely erased is what happened at Attica. And that, uh, for a younger generation, was a, a uh, prison riot that took place in the state prison of that name, uh, where there was a substantial loss of life. Uh, both among uh, the rioting prisoners and among the guards who were taken hostage. Uh, it, was, it was a bungle job. At first, Rockefeller tried to handle it through the attitudes of modern penology. He had um, a uh, state prison head, head of the State Department of, of Corrections, who uh, was of a modern penal philosophy. And they tried at first to let the prisoners express themselves. Then it, it got out of hand, and the pendulum swung the other direction, and a massive uh, lethal force was taken to suppress the, uh, the prison riot, restore order. Uh, the uh, subject has been one that the enemies of Nelson Rockefeller ne never fail to, to bring up. And I, I look upon it as, as not any kind of a deliberate attempt uh, but I look upon it as a, as a bungled handling of a, a very incendiary issue. Why do you think Attica happened? My understanding is that Attica was a hotbed of undress for a couple of reasons. First of all, it was vastly overcrowded. And when you overcrowd a pr prison, that means that the, that the sanitation facilities are not what they should be, that the, the food is not what it should be, that the, the sense of any privacy whatsoever is destroyed because the cells are overcrowded. You just, you just create a cauldron of discontent. On top of that, this was going on at a period in the 70s when there were a lot of uh, political tensions in the country, a lot of political turmoil. And so Attica had a lot of, of, of prisoners who were politically astute, had a sense of how you organize uh, unrest and how how you, um, how you commandeer people and aim them towards a, a, a particular objective, in this case, prison conditions. So between the fact that there were justified complaints in the prison and people who knew how to exploit them, you had Attica. But uh, certainly uh, there was a lot that happened with Attica that seemed to go against the grain of what Nelson Rockefeller was all about and what he had built his, uh, his career on as a, as a progressive uh, politician. How did, how did he so badly miscalculate uh, there? Well, as I said a moment ago, uh, he, he had placed the, the prisons under the leadership of a modern penologist, which he thought would, would take care of part of that problem. And uh, incidentally, the name of that uh, head of the corrections department was Russ Oswald, a, a very fine man whose, in, whose intentions were, were pure. Uh, but we were also in a period when crime was burgeoning in the state, mostly because of, of drug, drug dealing, 
drug superlords and drug minions. So the prisons became very, very overcrowded. And uh, consequently, this, 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 this stirred up the discontent as I described the reasons why overcrowded prisons are bad prisons. Now, then we get to an, another uh, uh, very highly, hotly controversial part of the Rockefeller record, and that was the Rockefeller drug laws, which have certainly done nothing to reduce prison populations. Uh, very harsh. It was a man who had tried all of the uh, more progressive policies to curb drug addiction, education, you, uh, promoting the use of methadone, establishing clinics. Nothing seemed to work. The problem just got it kept expanding. And here you had a man lashing out in frustration. And the result were these very, very harsh laws, uh, which we're still living with today, and which my judgment, uh, they certainly ought to be liberalized. Was, was uh, Governor Rockefeller out at Attica when the crisis took place? One, one of the issues uh, uh, during the course of the uprising was uh, that the governor did not go. He had obviously his representatives there, but he did not go to Attica. His judgment was that it would do nothing but make the situation more incendiary by having him as the as the focus, and so he did not go. Was that a good decision, a bad decision? We did, we can't read the future. That didn't happen. Did he go out after in the aftermath? No, he did not. And uh, you think that was a, a a mistake or not? It's it's hard to hard to judge how uh, a visit to Attica could have had any great effect on the uh, ugliness that had been stirred up by that event. He, he was you know, solicitous in his, in his speeches of the loss of life by members of the prison staff, prison guards, who were killed there. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, well, let me ask you this. I, I mentioned a name to you earlier, uh, Harry Albright, and I uh, know that you did do some work with him in the uh, administration. I wonder if you might uh, tell us some of your recollections of Harry. Well, Harry had come to us as, as a lawyer who had been in, involved in, in labor work. And um, he was an idea guy. Harry was uh, driven by issues. He became very serious about the governor's programs. Uh, high energy level, very active, and um, subsequently went off into a little bit different arena. He became what is called in the crudest terms, the patronage officer of the state, that is determining uh, who gets jobs where. But he did a good job of, of being Nelson Rockefeller's man in the field and drawing top people. For example, uh, there was in, in Massachusetts a wonderful urban developer who's doing a great job in Massachusetts called Ed Logue. And Nelson Rockefeller wanted him in New York. And Harry Albright would be one of the people who would be involved in seducing an Ed Logue to leave a very happy situation in Massachusetts and come to Albany. And I know uh, both of you uh, worked uh, with uh, uh, Nelson Rockefeller when he was vice president. How did, uh, how did that uh, uh, develop? No. Okay. No. Uh, am I, am I, I, are we going to edit your tape after? Oh, we, oh, yeah. we I, I, have, I don't remember Harry being involved. Okay. In the okay. Washington operation. Okay, not a problem. Yeah, I didn't know if you were just going to run the whole damn thing or edit it. Not at all. I hope you're going to edit it. Well, Get sure. the phone calls. Yeah. You know, it never occurred to me, Steve, to just unplug oh, yeah. the damn thing. <laughs> not a problem. Um, tape was easy. Right. <laughs> That's why you tape it. Um, let, let me ask you this, just in, in, in closing. I wonder if you if you uh, have any recollections of the CSEA when you might have uh, actually uh, first heard of the organization and. Uh, uh, what some of your impressions might have been? Well, I had uh, an experience uh, with the state that well preceded my involvement with uh, Governor Rockefeller. Uh, as a matter of fact, my, my first job upon coming out of the military and coming out of the uh, graduate program at Columbia University was in the governor's office in New York State under Governor Averill Harriman. I subsequently was uh, speechwriter for the Commissioner of Health. So I had been on the state payroll before, and I always had a, a warm feeling for the CSEA. 
I came out of a family background. My father was a member of a union. My mother was a member of a union. And uh, I was always delighted that uh, the CSEA was going after benefits that would help state employees generally and me specifically. So my feelings towards the CSEA have always been very warm. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you remember any kind of contact when you came into the workplace uh, with uh, uh, solicitation for the insurance program or uh, contact with uh, representatives? What I, what I do remember is that when I first uh, went to work for the state, uh, I was sat down by the personnel officer and told the uh, retirement program, the health benefits program. I remember my reaction was, uh, these are very generous. New York State looks like a good employer. What I realized later was that this didn't just fall from the heavens. It was worked for by the, by the proponents and representatives of workers in the state and through the CSEA. Do you, do you remember any dynamics between the CSEA and Governor Rockefeller? Any uh, specific instances? I, I can't go beyond the generalized necessity for the CSEA and the governor to sit down, particularly work out the Taylor Law. Okay. Great. All right, well, I think this will conclude. Okay. Thank you.